Hey everybody, welcome to day three of Plum Conference 2021. I'm here with Katie and she is going to provide a keynote for us that describes how to go from opaque to open. Wonderful, thank you Andy and hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for, um, for having me here today, coming to you live from my spare room in London. Um, my name is Katie and I'm the Chief Programme Officer on a major open source initiative in the apparel sector, the Open Apparel Registry. And I'm going to talk to you today about how open data is fundamentally changing lives and conditions for some of the most vulnerable people in the global garment industry. So before talking you through what the Open Apparel Registry is and the technology that it's built on, I'm going to give you frankly a pretty depressing overview of the state of the global garment industry and why we believe it's so desperately in need of fixing. And one point I do want to make is that this is not about high fashion. So if you wear if you wear clothing, even for those of you joining remotely, if it's a shirt on top and your pajama bottoms uh, on the bottom, like these issues affect you. They truly touch um, uh, all citizens globally. So what I'll do to start off with is begin by sharing some context on the, on the scale of the apparel and fashion industry. So a few headline stats to, to share with you all. Fashion is one of the biggest industries in the world and it generates around $2.5 trillion in global annual revenue. And figures vary, but the Ellen MacArthur Foundation estimates that around 300 million people are employed globally along the clothing value chain. And the majority of those people are young women, and many of those women have children and families to provide for, but the rights that they have access to in the workplace are limited and verbal, physical and sexual abuse are rife. Fashion's also an industry that displays incredible income disparity, and two of the Forbes top wealthiest people in the world are fashion industry leaders. So on the left, you can see Bernard Alnault, who is the chairman and chief exec of the LVMH empire, which owns multiple luxury brands, including familiar names like Dior, Givenchy, Louis Vuitton. And then on the right of this slide, you've got Amancio Ortega, who arguably invented fast fashion through the creation of his brand, Zara, which is part of what's gone on to become the Inditex group. But at the other end of the scale, you've got thousands of workers toiling in garment factories around the world, adding to the wealth of those and other members of the fashion elite. But those workers in the factories aren't even earning a minimum wage, let alone a living wage. So I've touched briefly on wealth disparity and a lack of living wages for garment workers, but unfortunately, these aren't the only issues affecting the industry. So we'll touch on some of the social and environmental impacts that the fashion industry has. Many people tuned in today will remember this tragic moment in history. It's the collapse of the Rana Plaza building in Dhaka, Bangladesh on the 23rd of April, 2013. In this industrial disaster, over 1,100 people were killed and more than 2,500 people were injured. And during the morning of that day, 23rd of April, many workers had spotted cracks in the wall of that building and they'd expressed their concern about going into work. But their managers responded to say that if they didn't go to work that day, they wouldn't just lose their salary for that day, but they'd lose their job. So with little alternative, fearful but desperate, the majority of workers entered the building that day under duress, but with horrific consequences. And all of this in order to meet the impossibly tight turnarounds imposed on factories by global brands to feed our appetite for fast fashion. Challenges in the fashion industry though, aren't solely social. As an industry, many stages of production are really heavily dependent on highly chemically intensive processes like dyeing and finishing treatments. But again, in order to cut corners and save costs, management standards are frequently lax. And that has impacts both on the health of workers handling chemicals, but also on local ecosystems and waterways. 
And it's worth remembering that those waterways are often the same places where people who live locally to the factories are washing and sourcing water for cooking and drinking. So how has this been allowed to happen? Well, to put it simply, supply chains in the fashion industry are incredibly complex and they're often murky with it. And that happens for a variety of different reasons. The first thing is that creating an item of clothing isn't as simple as that often low cost implies. So if you've got a label in the shirt that you're wearing today, it might say made in Vietnam, but that's only telling a really, really small part of the story, which is where that product was finally assembled, cut and sewn together. You need to think about all the steps that go before that. So if it's a cotton shirt, where was that cotton grown and who grew that cotton? How did it then go from the cotton farm to the spinner, which is the step where that raw material is spun into yarn and then onto fabric? What colour is it? Who dyed it? Has it been given some kind of special finishing treatment that might be waterproofing for outdoor enthusiasts? Who cut the pattern and then stitched all of those different bits together? If it's got buttons, where did those come from? And if there's maybe a spark sparkly little bit of embellishment on the chest with a slogan, how did that get fixed to the top? There'll be a brand label in the neck, there'll be a care label in the side. How did all of those pieces get stitched in? Where did they come from? How were they made? And if your top looked really slick and nicely pressed when you bought it, sometimes the process of ironing that shirt can happen in a completely different location as well. So I think you get the idea that producing fashion in and of itself is fairly complex. And then the challenge that you have is buyers at big brands who are being set challenging targets to continually secure lower and lower prices. And you get left with our globalized fashion system where the process of creating one ordinary t-shirt can involve multiple different shipments between multiple different countries. And so if you count those steps that I just talked you through of producing one simple t-shirt and then remind yourself of this, that's just one product in the inventory of brands that are churning out thousands of different products around the world on a weekly basis. So how can better and open data help? When you're dealing with that many layers, keeping track of data in your supply chain as seemingly simple as the names and addresses of factories can be really, really challenging. And what we found in building the Open Apparel Registry is that at as basic a level as name and address information, the quality of data in the apparel industry is poor. So what you can see on the screen now are um, genuine data submissions that we received in the very early stages of building the Open Apparel Registry. And if you look closely, you've got all sorts of issues relating to completely the wrong countries being assigned to facility addresses. Um, and, and users coming to us saying, I don't understand why this is producing an error message. And so we start from a premise of if you don't have a clear understanding of where the factories in your supply chain are, how can you possibly have any sense of the social or environmental conditions in those factories? And we have subsequently heard stories that this data is in such a mess and there's such limited or historically um, there was such limited understanding of uh, facility location and shared connections at facilities. Auditors were turning up two days in a row at the same facility thinking they were going to a completely different place. We've also heard about major global brands spending huge amounts of money and no small amount of staff resource on rolling out improvement programs only to discover that another brand had run exactly the same program at exactly the same factory, but the facility owner just didn't tell them that that work had already taken place. And so you then end up in a situation where some factories are receiving duplicate improvement programs twice, whilst a factory down the road might not have access to those improvement programs at all. So at a basic level, if you can elevate this quality of data, and think carefully about how to present that data to industry, the opportunities to improve uh, all sorts of processes, facilitate greater collaboration and improve efficiencies are, um, are limitless. So 
we built the open apparel registry in response to this set of needs in the apparel sector. And so at a very basic level, what is it? It's an open source tool in which we're mapping garment facilities worldwide and we're allocating a unique ID to each of those facilities. What I'll hope to do now, and it's loaded, is play you a short animation just so you can get a sense of how um, users can search the Open Apparel Registry and what it enables them to do. always the challenging part of skipping on <laughs> after watching a video in Canva. So what I'm going to show you now is um, it's a rich picture and this is a visualization of the strategy of the Open Apparel Registry to open up supply chain data for the benefit of all. And I'll talk you through a few elements of this um, of this illustration. Um, but really what I want to emphasize is that the power of our approach is in transforming messy and inconsistent data sets into structured data sets. And all of those are made freely available to all stakeholders, anyone who wants to make use of the data under an open data license. And that's all tied to our belief that when everyone working in global supply chains enjoys equal access to high quality data, opportunities rapidly open up to shift the industry onto a more sustainable and equitable path. So what we're showing here is that messy data, that those kind of pools of data um, at the bottom of the illustration and those are ingested into the Open Apparel Registry. Our three core values are um, that it's open source, that it's accessible and it's neutral. And what we mean by neutral is that we exist to serve the, in the interests of all stakeholders in the apparel industry, whether that's major global brands, tiny civil society organizations operating in producing countries or certification schemes and factory groups themselves. And so what you can see on the top of the platform is um, a different view of the world than many of us in, the, uh, in Europe and North America are used to seeing. It's really rooted in the idea that apparel production takes place um, in the global south. You can track the journey um, through, the, uh, through the orange fabric and the different processes of that orange shirt being made. Um, we are a platform that's used globally, so you'll see um, non-English on, uh, on the illustration as well to represent um, the diversity of our users and all of the connections that Open Apparel Registry data is able to make. So what does it do? The Open Apparel Registry creates one common registry of facility names and addresses and allocates that industry standard facility ID to each facility in the database. And the importance of that is that it eliminates um, issues with matching across multiple inconsistent databases. So prior to the Open Apparel Registry being built, 
data about apparel supply chains was locked away in different databases, there was no interoperability between systems, it was siloed, and it was inaccessible and not in a machine readable format. And so by ingesting it all into the open apparel registry, making it openly available and systematizing that data, we're able to um, facilitate in-facility collaboration between different organizations. So this is a unique ID, which is one of the most powerful parts of the tool. So it's allocated to each facility in the database. But what's really important to stress is that we're not trying to replace any existing ID schemas, but it can be used alongside existing ID schemas and serves as a central source of truth alongside name and address data. What I will say, though, is that we're seeing many um, movers and shakers, if you like, in the apparel sector adopt our IDs as their own internal schema. So major global brand Clarks now uses OAR IDs as their preferred ID schema for their facilities. But if I think back to when we were building the tool, I want to talk you through some of the technical challenges that we were facing. So. It was the data, it's always the data. Um, you've seen some screenshots of the state of the data that was being shared with us, but there were a few different elements that feed into this. It is a global platform and it's dependent on contributions from users who have perhaps had less exposure to technology um, than many others. Um, our data is contributed um, to the tool by industry. So that's major global brands, it's certification schemes, it's factory groups and others. And the challenge that we had is that there's no industry-wide standard for how that data was being shared. And so what we were coming across was that data was often um, locked away in PDFs, embedded in maps in websites or on tables. The next challenge that we had um, relates to the global nature of apparel supply chains and native language names were being translated inconsistently into English. So that, that variation uh, in names, depending on who was doing the translation, uh, was quite challenging. And then this gets quite meta, but there is no um, agreed structured format for addresses in many um, production regions. So turn right five kilometers after the post office may well be a genuine address, um, but there's no structure as you know I would be familiar with in terms of uh, number, street name, city and zip code. And then the final challenge that we had was that we were dealing with a lot of international character sets, so huge um, production capabilities in locations like China, and that was something that we needed to think through. The next challenge that we needed to think through was the maths. So we had a goal to reach 50,000 facilities in our database within our first year, uh, excuse me, within our first two years. We did hit that target, but what did that mean in terms of our processing times? So you can see what it looks like uh, on this screen. When we think about how many facilities um, we had this goal to have in the database and then what additional data might be added to the database um, and what this means when you multiply out in terms of the number of comparisons. And we landed at this figure of 6.94 hours, which frankly isn't ex uh, acceptable. So we needed some kind of shortcut. And that shortcut was DGU. Many of you may well be familiar with this. It's an open source Python library for accurate and scalable fuzzy matching, record deduplication and entity resolution. And so if I read um, directly from um, the dedupe uh, manual, du duplicate records almost always share something in common. So if we can define groups of data that share something and only compare the records in that group or in that block, you can dramatically reduce the number of comparisons that need to be made. And so if we define those blocks well, then very few comparisons will need to be made and we'll still have confidence. So you can see that by using dedupe as our preferred, um, as our preferred approach, we could train a new model and, match, uh, and process, excuse me, thousands of matches in less than four minutes. And that felt acceptable. 
So that was a very uh, sort of high level overview of how the GG, excuse me, the dedupe algorithm is working for us and what this then means in terms of uh, the way that we're um, organizing and presenting data is that we are enabling greater collaboration and efficiencies for all stakeholder groups. I've talked about them already um, in the apparel sector through that common ID and through sharing this data openly. So it's, um, it's enabling efficient collaboration and all of the different third party organizations that are connected to facilities um, can discover that they share that connection and quickly identify ways of working together on improvements. I talked about historically data being sat in silos. They can now, that, all that data can now be synchronized using the OAR ID. And then we also have an API. So connecting through that API um, enables further programmatic push and pull exchanges of data. So that's the platform that we've built. That's how it's being used. Since we launched in March of 2019, we've reached nearly 70,000 facilities in the database. We know there's a lot more out there to be found, but that database is growing um, on a daily basis. Um, and the diversity of organizations that are contributing data to the tool is growing all the time. And so what I want to talk about a little bit now is the work that we're doing beyond our sort of core focus on the open apparel registry, just to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing to take the industry with us, because we have seen really great progress since we launched the tool in March 2019. But there's still a lot more work to be done to educate the sector, not just about why it's important to share this data, but why it's important to do so openly. So the first piece of work that we've done is to collaborate with others in the sector to come up with the very catchily titled open data standard for the apparel sector. So in recognizing um, two things, the first is the low technical exposure of some of our users, but secondly, um, that often people just want to be given a set of rules to follow um, and then um, and then to put those rules into action. We've come up with this very simple standard to help organizations make their supplier disclosure um, transparent, accessible and useful. So this is really recognizing that many people still don't understand that data format matters if people are going to be able to go on and work with that data. So it's a simple set of instructions for any organization that is looking to start sharing their data and that wants to do it in the most useful way possible rather than just to uh, complete a tick box exercise. And then the next thing that we've done is this is a very recent development. There's a lot of movement in terms of um, legislation at the moment. So we, together with others in this sector, including Clean Clothes Campaign, I know many of you will know Paul, um, and another open data platform called Wikirate, recently published an open letter calling for open data principles to be incorporated into EU corporate sustainability, the reporting directive legislation. So again, you've got these sort of high level decisions being made around um, what is going to be expected of organizations in terms of what they're reporting, but we're really eager to ensure that the how of this reporting is thought through and that principles of open data are incorporated into that legislation. So that's a little bit about the work that we're doing to take the sector with us. I'd love to hear feedback on that and, um, and if people have ideas for other ways that we could engage with a sector that historically has been a little bit far behind when it comes to um, data sharing um, and, and making effective use of technology, but um, is, I would argue, doing its best to catch up now. But what I want to share next is um, some stories of the OAR in action. So what is the impact that we've had? What difference does it make when you start to think through the way that you organize and present data to a sector? So I'll share a couple of stories now, depending on how we're doing for time, I might well be able to share some more examples at the end, but I've cherry picked um, a couple of old favorites, but also some more recent really impactful stories that have come through. 
So I've mentioned them already. Um, Clean Clothes has been a long-standing supporter of ours. Um, and Paul Roland, who many of you know, is a very um, valued member of our board. For those of you who aren't so familiar with the organisation, it's a global alliance dedicated to improving working conditions and empowering workers in the global garment and sportswear industries. And as I said, they very early on recognised the power of the Open Apparel Registry and the way that they could make use of our data. Um, and they do this to remediate on behalf of some of the most vulnerable people working in apparel supply chains. So their story, they use OAR data both in their urgent appeal work um, and that's when they're responding to concrete violations that have been reported by workers and by unions. But they also use data in their research initiatives, um, which includes their living wage through increased transparency projects. And what OAR data enables their trade unions, to, trade unions that they're working with to do is identify which brands are sourcing from which factories. And there was an example where um, a union leader was dismissed and that information about which brands were sourcing from that factory was used in combination with data from um, an initiative called the Transparency Pledge. And that revealed that the brand was also a member of four multi-stakeholder initiatives. And so in consultation with the Clean Clothes campaign, the union picked the multi-stakeholder initiative that was known for the fastest response times on grievance mechanisms and was able to swiftly resolve the issue. And what that looked like in practice was that within five days, that union leader was reinstated to her full job, including back pay. And that speeds up a process that ordinarily could take upwards of months. So that's the first example. The second is much more recent um, and it comes from the New Conversations Project, which is housed in Cornell University's School of Industrial and Labor Relations um, in the US. And it's dedicated to independent research and action that measurably improves labor conditions in global supply chains. So with apologies for a slightly text heavy slide here, but OAR data has been used by the New Conversations Project to map which facilities are going to be underwater by 2030. It's quite bleak, but it's, it's important. Um, so the team at the New Conversations Project was interested in the reach of apparel brands, circular economy and sustainability strategies. They were writing a new paper on the post-COVID future of the apparel industry. And what they were really eager to understand was whether these strategies were inclusive of workers and suppliers and what impacts were being considered in relation to those stakeholders. Because they knew from past work that flooding and extreme heat from climate breakdown were, uh, excuse me, were disrupting production and livelihoods in various apparel hubs. And so for this paper, they needed to be able to plot apparel production against sea level and heat projections in those locations. And so the OAR provided them with a unique data set for that work. It's an open data platform that anyone can access, but it's also wide enough and deep enough to cover all of the locations that the team at Cornell needed for their research. And it's got thousands of data points for those regions. So the team overlaid their analysis um, of OAR data onto sea level projections from climate centrals excuse me, from Climate Central, to give them a new look at how flooding is threatening production and how new investments and countless jobs in the fashion industry's production centre hotspots, what that looks like. And those resulting maps showed gripping results, which actually went on to pique the interest of mainstream media and the results have been covered by Reuters and then gone out uh, globally through, uh, through that network. And they shared with us that the alternative to using OAR data, so to have to build a factory location data set of their own, was just, it was a non-starter, it was unthinkable, due to the time, the money and the data access it would require. So it's provided them with the open data set that they needed for their work. Um, and enabled them to publish really compelling research that is going to go on and help with decision making around the future of the sector in those regions. So I've shared quite a gloomy overview of the apparel sector. I've given what I hope are some um, a kind of inspiring examples of the difference that data can make and how it can be a catalyst for change. 
But now what I want to do is share a few ways that you as individuals can create change um, using OAR as well. So the first thing I would do is encourage you to check us out on GitHub. I'm very happy for these slides to be shared afterwards so you'll have access to all of these links. Um, and search the OAR to see which of your favourite brands are sharing their data openly on the platform. And if your favourite brands aren't, contact them um, to encourage them to share their supply chain data. I'd also say educate yourself on the issues. I've given you a broad overview. There's a lot more out there um, to learn for sure. Um, and then I would say consider how you purchase and reuse clothes. Um, there's such a growing movement for, uh, for secondhand. I'm wearing a rented shirt today. The rental market is really interesting as well. So um, thoughtful, thoughtful consumerism would be my top tip there. Um, but also help grow the open apparel registry, explore the tool, um, read a report that we published. So in August of this year, um, we uh, published this report, um, Untangling Apparel Supply Chains from Open Data. Um, it's, it's a theme that we talk about a lot. Um, and in that report, we share the story of everything we learned in building the tool over the past two years. Um, so I'd really encourage you to read more of that. And there's a, there's a much deeper dive into the technology behind the tool in that report as well, for those of you who are interested. Um, and then sign up for our news, follow us uh, on, on all the socials as well. Um, and share your ideas with us. We genuinely, some of the best ideas for future developments on the Open Apparel Registry have come from our users. So we're always really interested um, to hear from people in terms of their experience of using the tool and what we might want to do next. So very welcome to get in touch with me at the contact details on the screen now. I know there's a separate Q&A session later. So um, the next thing I'll share is um, I've got an appendix with some different resources to help you um, if you're interested in going away and learning more about the sector. And then I'm going to indulge myself and tell a couple of extra stories as well, because I've got the luxury of time with this slot. So for those of you who enjoy uh, a good old fashioned book, these would be my top tips um, in terms of what to read to learn more about the sector. I think Fashionopolis, the one at the top of the list, um, would be my would be my top recommendation because it's the most recent of all of them. And as well as the doom and gloom, it's got really practical examples um, of how to create change and organisations that are doing things differently. Um, and we are optimistic as an organisation at Open Apparel Registry, so I think that's important. Um, in terms of journalists and commentators and industry movements, um, these are the people who I think are writing some of the most interesting content out there and the most challenging. Um, so I would encourage you to follow them on your, uh, on your news feed of choice. Um, and then our technical project manager introduced me to this wonderful concept of rage donation. So when you're really livid at the state of the industry um, and you want to do something uh, from the comfort of your home to try and make a difference, um, channel, that, channel that rage into a donation to an organisation doing really great work. So these are some of the organisations um, that I would recommend you consider um, making a donation to as well. Um, and so to end with a couple more case studies. The Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, again, a really early advocate for our work who very quickly recognised what our data could do for them. It's a non-profit that's dedicated to advancing human rights in business and eradicating abuse. So it helps communities and NGOs get companies to address human rights concerns and provides those companies with an opportunity to present their response in full. So back in early 2019, just when the tool had launched, the OAR enabled the HRRC to quickly respond to the dismissal of over a thousand garment workers in Cambodia who were striking over the non-payment of benefits. So the organisation was able to swiftly use the OAR to identify brands sourcing from the factories and to ask for their response and plan of action. Two of those brands responded and launched investigations. And the result of those investigations were that through pressure from many quarters, the majority of workers were reinstated. They got their jobs back. 
And then the final case study I'll share is uh, from an organization called Wage Indicator. So they're a nonprofit that gathers and presents data on wages and working conditions in over 140 different countries around the world. And again, they recognize that by sharing structured data on wages and working conditions, their research enables comparative studies and helps workers to fairly assess their factories and advocate for better working conditions. So it works extensively to track changes in apparel supply chains, and that includes facility closures and relocations. And that's something that happens a lot in the apparel sector for any number of different reasons. But what they were finding was that the process of collecting and managing supply chain data was manual and it was really time consuming. So making use of OAR data enables wage indicator to cross check facility name and address information much more efficiently. And then more recently, wage indicator has been able to make use of OAR data as part of its work during COVID-19. So by cross-checking against OAR contributor data for facilities surveyed during Wage Indicator's COVID-19 impact survey, the organisation was able to work on comparative studies, looking at whether facilities that produce for global brands have changed their working conditions during the pandemic to ensure the safety of their workers. And so through its partnerships with local trade unions, this data has been used to more effectively advocate on behalf of workers at both the factory level, but also at the national level. And so using OAR data as part of its COVID-19 impact survey enabled wage indicator um, and the trade unions they work with to advocate for the rights of workers in 42 different factories during the pandemic. Um, so on that note, um, that is uh, everything I have to share with you today. Hopefully um, that has helped to bring to life um, the difference that open data can make in an apparel, in, excuse me, a sector that is so desperately ripe for change. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for uh, such a fascinating talk. I really, we really appreciate you being able to provide us with such an interesting um, aspect of the garment industry. Um, we do have one question that I think Paul might have addressed, but I wanted to see if you could add a little bit of color to this and with in the Slideo. Kim asked, does the apparel industry help in your effort? It seems that they may prefer a opacity, opacity. And I wonder if you had, uh, maybe we could take this discussion into the uh, Jitsi uh, for some face-to-face -face, and I'll post that link into the track one. Sure, Slack. that sounds good. Um, I will reopen. <laughs> I'll reopen my Slack now, um, and uh, yeah, if I need to hop over to another link, I can. Uh, I can do that now. Great, thank you.